Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the webinar on the results of the Chilean congressional and presidential elections. We will wait a minute or two until more participants filter in. We had hundreds of registrations for today's event, so it may take a minute or two for them to come in. Uh, well, yeah, and they're coming in fast and furious. Um, we'll wait another few seconds. Okay, let, let's, let's get started. Uh, again, welcome uh, to this uh, very interesting conversation that we're about to have. Uh, my name is Ken Franco, President of Canadian Council for the Americas with Martha Blackwell, our Vice President, who is critical in planning this event uh, for us and with us. We're pleased to have you with us. Uh, this is another one of the events that we've done in Chile in close collaboration with the Columbia University Global Center in Santiago, which is always a pleasure for all of us uh, to do, uh, and represented by its director, Karen Paniacek. It's always wonderful to work with you, Karen. I thought maybe you'd like to say a few words before we get, guard, uh, get going. Thanks, Ken. Uh, we're delighted to join forces again in this joint venture. Uh, I think this is the third time we team up to analyze election with a great lineup of experts. And we're very excited. These are exciting times in Chile, post Sunday, uh, puzzling, uncertain. So we'll hear from them about what we can expect probably during the next month uh, until the runoff, which is on Sunday, December um, 19th. So thanks again, Ken, always great working together with you and Martha. Thank you, Karen. Um, let me, I see we have questions already coming in, including one from India. So let me just say we will entertain written questions today. Uh, we will do our best to integrate them into the flow of the conversation. If your question isn't specifically asked, um, please don't feel bad about that. We, uh, we there's a lot to cover uh, and not that much time in which to do it. Uh, just a few other, um, notices this event, a tape, uh, the video of this event will be available on CCA website, ccacanada.com by the end of today at, uh, at the latest, I would think. Uh, in terms of other logistical or uh, news, um, I invite all of the listeners to listen to, we have a pretty fulsome schedule from now until the end of the year, at least uh, in addition to our private events, uh, our, our free public events on December 1st, we'll return with our 11th episode of Buscando el Centro Politico, looking for the political center in Colombia. That'll be on December 1st with Ingrid Betancourt, Humberto de la Calle, and Ivan Marulanda. Uh, and that will be a conversation of the conclave or the meeting that they're having this Sunday between the coalition de Esperanza to talk about closing ranks amongst the various candidates and their congressional lists. On December 9th, we will have a very interesting panel, um, another award-winning panel on untruths and consequences and the results of, of Brazil's representations uh, at COP26 and what that might portend. We will be back here doing another public event on either December 20th or 21st, uh, analyzing the second round of the Chilean elections. Uh, and for all of those uh, who wonder why we spent so much time on the Colombian center, over 11 episodes and counting, uh, well, we'll find out exactly why when we talk about Chile today and the event that we did in Peru is why a conversation about a center is actually a, a critical conversation to be had everywhere in the world these days uh, and particularly in Latin America. So with that, let's get right to the uh, panelists. Uh, I know people watching know who they are. They've seen them before. Um, they're always backed by popular acclaim. We have Carmen Le Foulon, who's a researcher at Centro de Estudios Públicos. Claudia Heiss, head of political science at the Institute for Public Affairs at U de Chile. Cristina Vitar, who is senior partner and president Azerta, at Azerta and Pamela Figueroa, who's professor at U de Santiago. Um, thank you all again for being with us uh, today. 
Uh, Carmen, you're the statistical expert uh, on these, and particularly with respect to analyzing elections. We know not all the statistics have come in yet, certainly not all the statistics that you would like to have to do uh, backwards and forwards and upwards and downwards analysis of everything that happened and who voted, but maybe you could start off uh, talking a little bit about the most important statistics with related to uh, the first round. Carmen? Uh, hi, Ken. Uh, hi, all my colleagues and panelists. Hi, Marta, and everyone for listening to us today. Um, I'm going to share a small presentation, um, which I need to be able to share. Great. Uh, so, so first of all, um, I'd like to especially thank Ariadna Chuaki, Javier Amure, Pablo Enrique, and Clemente Larraín, who've been crunching numbers and web scrubbing and all stuff so we can present some data today. So um, on, the, on November 21st, we have four concurrent elections. We have uh, for the president, which has the most uh, media coverage for the Senate, which was partially renewed for the lower house of Camara and for Core, who are um, regional uh, councils, sort of uh, the translation. So, and, and we see, so by first I wanted to show um, the blue bar is the percentage uh, obtained by the presidential candidate of the coalition. So we have Frente Social Cristiano, who is cast, uh, Apro Dignidad, who is bodied, who are the two forth runners that will go for the second round. Then we have a new party, a completely new party that was born in 2019, but with a candidate that ran um, on the 2013 election, Franco Parisi, who, who got 13% of the vote. Uh, then Chile Podemos Más, which is the coalition of the former president uh, with Sebastián Sichel, and Nuevo Pacto Social, which are the parties that had run successfully for many years in Chile, La, La Antigua Concertación, uh, with Diana Proboste, the pro with Meo, Marco Enrico Minami, then we have UPA, Eduardo Artes, which has run systematically, and others. So my main point um, that I wanted to start showing is that there are stark differences between the proportion that the candidate, the presidential candidate of the coalition obtained, especially Jose Antonio Cas, who obtained more than 25%, who is the full position, um, and his part, his coalition got around a little more than 12% of the vote on the lower house and a little less around 8% of the core. So in a prueba de dignidad, we have a smaller difference between what obtained, what body to obtain versus his own coalition. Parisi, uh, which is surprising because it's a really new party and had a relatively successful campaign uh, with 8% of the vote. And then we have the CTEL, uh, which as we all have heard, uh, had a very low um, electoral return, similar, almost equal to Parisi, but his own coalition got a fairly good uh, percentage of the vote on the for the Senate, for the House, and for Core. And we observed a similar pattern, but with less differences with Nuevo Pacto Social, Yasna Brogost. So there are differences, and, and it's important to see when we're thinking about the second round election, uh, those who voted for um, CTEL uh, and those who vote in the first round for Chile Podemos Más, but not for uh, in the lower house, but not for the president, where they are going. So that's the first question. The, the second data that I think is interesting is what happened. Sorry, that's a translation mistake. Uh, president, we, the two main um, coalitions run primary elections organized by CERVEL, which was bodied for a pro dignidad and Sebastian Sitchell. Uh, what we see is that Sebastian Boric got uh, overall at the national level only 56,000 more votes than the coalition total. But, and, but interestingly, he got uh, almost all, so almost all votes, those who voted for the other candidate, Hadwe, we could say we're never sure because we, we don't know exactly that. But in terms of composition of the vote, in terms of per, per number of votes, it seems that they transferred to Boric, which did not happen with Sitel. Sitel obtained 440 less votes in his coalition total. So probably many of those who voted for other candidates did not transfer for him because he obtained uh, 200 more votes than his own primary vote. So he was able to uh, grow a bit, 
but not all the votes from his coalition transfers to him, which we, we also see that uh, in the previous slides, as I show you, those that voted Chile Podemos Mas did not vote at everyone for him. Um, so what is another interesting point, and I'll go briefly with this, is the regional distribution of votes. So the zero is the average regional vote. So it's the percentage of votes per region and the average. So we can see in red in those regions where each candidate fared worse than his average and in light blue, those that he fared better than he, in his in average. So we see Boric and Sitel, uh, well, starting from Boric, he behaved worse on the North, better his best, best, uh, electoral vote was on Valparaíso, so metropolitana, so urban, urban areas, highly dense populated, and uh, Magallanes, which is his home region. Citel uh, has a similar pattern, not, not in the south, but mostly in the center. Proboste does not have big changes regarding her average, except in her home region, which is Atacama. And we see Cast now with a clear pattern, if he breaks in the north with Tarabaca, which is at the north, um, but his main, uh, his strongest voting are in the south, in the regional south, in more urban, um, rural areas, and also in areas which have been affected by some um, insecurities and political conflicts. And Parisi has a great behavior at the north, and as expected, lower behavior in the other regions. Um, but it's important to note, uh, and we, we could discuss a bit later what happens with the Parisi vote, uh, but a, a few keynotes or key points. Um, up north, he, there's a, his campaign was very anti-immigration and up north would have a higher percentage of immigrant population there. But also what is interesting is that Parisi, by, for this election, he got a similar percentage, just a 3% higher than in the previous election that he ran in 2013. But in the 2013 election, the political scenario was completely different. We have a, a poll position of Michel Bachelet, which has more than 45% of the uh, valid vote, and the second was Evelyn Matei with 25%. So, so his 10% wasn't that relevant, which is, which is why here uh, his 13% is highly relevant for uh, the two for brothers. And just a taste of uh, the composition, com Congress composition, um, we see that the, um, the center right, uh, which is yellow, had a 34% uh, of the vote. The big news here in Chile is that the Senate, which is the upper house, had a 50-50 split for the first time uh, since the return to democracy, um, except when we have the designated uh, senators, but since it was completely um, uh, popularly elected, it's the first time this has made big news. And we also observe, um, a higher, a bit more than a third of the vote from the center right, and the uh, we have a 24% of the seats are from the coalition of uh, Bodit, and 24% of the seats are for um, the coalition of Yamna Proboste, and we see this 4%, which is Partido de la Gente, which is the coalition of Parisi, this kind of outsider, that was able to elect uh, lower house deputies. So how how this look in the historical evolution. So what we see starting from 2013, and this is the evolution of coalition, the proportion of votes earned by the coalition uh, as it is formed today, because we have in the past some changes of parties between, but what, as if they were formed by the parties of today, we see that the pro dignidad has systematically increased um, at the constitutional convention had 18% of the votes and got 24 one at this election. Nuevo Pacto Social, which is La Concertación mostly, had a dramatically dramatical fall from 43 in 2013, 30 in 2017, to 14 and 17 this year. And Chile Podemos Más, which is the government coalition, also has a fall from 35, 39 to 21, 25. Uh, we have this emergence of this new uh, party, which is a more far-right uh, coalition. Then we have this outsider. And the big difference between all these, and which this is slashed because it's different, because on the constitutional convention election, we were able and, uh, to elect uh, parties uh, in 
independents were able to run as least. So just to finish a taste, um, we see the electoral participation. The pattern of electoral participation, this is a, just an association of poverty index of the county uh, on 2017 and the par electoral participation. For the plebiscite, the um, uh, socioeconomic bias decreased, but, it, and, but we observe that the same pattern between the 2017 and 2021 uh, in terms of first vote. Um, which is a different pattern, but it's again the same rationale. Uh, the plebiscite showed a, a much greater change in terms of the association between poverty and participation in other regions, not the capital region, uh, and both first rounds on 2017 and 2017 are more similar and not a stark effect. So I hope I haven't exceeded my time and no, not at all. And if, if if there's anything else you want to add, don't we? <laughs> feel free. That was that was very illuminating. Any any other final comments before we we'll bring you back in, obviously, for more. But anything else you wanted to touch on? Um, well, I no, I'll 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 leave for discussion later. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Okay, thank you for that. There's there's a lot there, uh, and we'll and hopefully we'll get to a lot of it. Uh, in, in during the conversation. Um, Claudia, I, I wanted to, to turn to you now. Um, this election has been portrayed uh, in the press, international press, and, and obviously to a degree locally as well as, as a second round between extremes, right? And in July, if I remember correctly, when we did our, did our event on the primaries, uh, we were remarking that it was interesting that both uh, Seychell had beaten candidates or in his coalition further to the right, and that Boric had beaten Hadoué, who was certainly further to the left. And so the thought was, well, maybe Chile and voter, voters really do want to keep things into some sort of center, maybe a little bit of an elastic center, but certainly not out on the extremes. The narrative now uh, is that the extremes are carrying the day, uh, and that you know the center has fallen a bit, although as Carmen has just said, with the congressional elections, you'd have a hard time making the case that there's no center left in, in Chile, again, which we'll get to. But the question, Claudia, is the following, is when we look at Boric, for example, and we'll talk about Cast as well, but when we look at Boric from a Canadian point of view or a Western European point of view, in a country like Chile that is highly privatized, much more so than the uh, country than Canada or the countries in Western Europe. Is Boric uh, extreme? Let's let's put it that way. Is he an ex extreme reflection or uh, talking about fundamental structural changes in Chile? I think this is a very good question and it's something that we will be studying probably in coming months. Uh, particularly trying to gather more empirical data to, to make these affirmations. Is Chile a polarized society or is it not? It's something that has been in the debate recently. And so far, what we have been saying, and most people have been saying, is that Chilean society has not so far been really polarized. Um, if you see, for instance, uh, the polls, when, when you ask for a political identification, for instance, in the in the SEP poll of uh, August 2021, um, in, in the left-right axis, uh, people tended to uh, position themselves more on the center. Um, and I think a similar a similar conclusion can be derived from the 80% vote in the place side, when 80% voted for a change in the constitution. That doesn't look like polarization. Um, on the other hand, I think there's agreement that political elites have been uh, getting more and more polarized in their political discourse, in the fear um, they, they uh, have imbued their, uh, um, their characterizations of the opponent. Uh, and uh, also I think, uh, so that's one point, political polarization versus social polarization. But I think that this is changing. So I think this uh, analysis uh, uh, probably will change after this election. I think the result of this election with an extremely divided Congress, 
really tight Congress and um, in both chambers. Uh, and the result of the of the election of gas with the high vote or vote of gas will polar will begin polarizing society. So I think we will see a phenomenon of a polarization that really started in political elites and in the political dispute among uh, representatives that will start uh, permeating society and will. So I expect more polarization to come in uh, in coming months. A second point uh, I want to make regarding your your question is the relationship between caste as an extreme and Boric as another extreme. I think that, and you mentioned the comparison to Canada, I think, uh, I think it's not correct to characterize caste and Boric as, as symmetrical opposites. I think Artes would be the equivalent, perhaps, of caste in the political spectrum, and Artes only got 1.5% of the vote, so a very small vote with a candidate that is un clearly anti-capitalist and really wants uh, a very radical change of the model. What Boric has proposed is not a radical change of the model, it's a social democratic program that I think in theory is similar to the program of the former Concertacion party, to the center-left party, in theory. So at least one part of the Concertacion, perhaps not the more conservative uh, Christian Demo Democrats who, vote, who didn't vote in that direction, but the Socialist Party, the PPD, and, uh, and even the Radical Party, who, who were part of that coalition, did have um, a social policy similar to the ones proposed by Boric. What Boric is saying is that th that coalition that was in power, either for practical concerns, for strategic concerns, because they were in a coalition with more conservative groups, did not put forward that program of uh, a welfare state, basically. So I don't think caste, uh, Boric can be considered a radical leftist as caste can be considered a radical rightist because caste is really proposing um, no, uh, uh, measures that are not compatible with, with what we know as representative democracy, uh, a traditional representative democracy um, that uh, is within the you know, international consensus of the defense of human rights, et cetera. He's, he's proposing to create, for instance, a uh, uh, international uh, alliance with other countries to prosecute leftist uh, uh, leaders in Latin America, similar to what the dictatorship did with the Operación Condor. He has proposed uh, eliminating the, the um, um, Ministry of Women, and he's proposing uh, very radical measures against immigrants. So he's very much, and he has denied global warming and, 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 and claim that Chile should leave international organizations and international human rights treaties. So I think he's very much like Bolsonaro or Donald Trump in, in its isolation, its extreme right, negation of human rights violations, et etc. Et uh, something that is not that is really like different from right wing democratic policies. So I, I don't think Cas represents the democratic right in Chile. He represents the the hairs of Pinochet. So I, it, so I don't think it's a symmetrical um, uh, left-right divide. Uh, th thank you, Claudia. Um, Christina, your views on this? Well, thank you. First of all, thank you, Ken. Thank you, the Canadian Council of the Americas and Colombia uh, for inviting us again and always bringing us back to this, this excellent panel. Um, I, I would like to start by saying that the results of this of, of, of this election, at least in the presidential uh, candidate, and and were were expected in the polls. Most polls already told us that Boric and Cast were going to be passing to second round. But I would like to stress that I think the most important thing that happened in this presidential election is that the results constitute a major shift in Chile's recent political history. The two coalitions that had been at the forefront of politics since the return of democracy in 1990 were relegated to fourth and fifth place. O sea, Sebastián Sichel and Yasna Proboste representing those coalitions were basically o sea, not even third, which is, which is pretty amazing. I think that transformation to the country's political landscape is really good. That was not exactly the same in Congress, which is good as well. As it, if we see the Senate, uh, the Senate for the first time, we have a tied Senate, 25-25 for both left and right. It's more diverse, probably more 
more, more candidates, more uh, diversity, but it's the first time we have 100%. Uh, the Senate is even, evenly split between right and left, and that is something that gives stability and I think is good for Chile. The markets recognized it yesterday. The exchange rate recognized it yesterday. I think that Senate and also the Chamber of Deputies is also very important because we were expecting a huge debacle for the center right that did not occur. And basically, if you add up Chile Podemos mass, 53 seats plus Frente Social Cristiano from the Republican Party, 15 seats that they obtained, you have 68 seats against 79 of the leftist parties, which but at the same time, very important, more diversity, more parties. We already have 21 parties in the Chamber of Deputies, which definitely brings a, a challenge, a very important challenge for whoever wins this election. Uh, starting today, I believe the two contenders for the second round will have to moderate their speeches, will have to go and look for that center. I think center, the center in Chile does exist. Uh, we have an important population that voted for Sichel, for Jasna Proboste. I would even say, well, Mayo is more of a own man, but uh, if you add Mayo and maybe Parisi, anti-political, but centrist at the end of the day, very populist, if you add that, there's a lot of uh, uh, electorate there to go and, and conquer. And I think what they need to do is go and moderate their positions. I think already Cast did it the night when he won. I don't think Boric did it as well, but I think both have very open possibilities of winning the second round. And it's going to be interesting what happens in the next four weeks, which is very, very little time. But at the same time in politics, things happen and change drastically, as we have seen in Chile changing. Sichel was supposedly going to be in second round and he fell in, dramatically. The, Yasna never came up. Lavin and Halwe died, supposedly being the elected candidates. So we're in a very volatile uh, 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 position and anything can happen. But I, I think the good news here is there's a signal for moderation and both candidates will have to go and moderate the second round for sure and look for those that are in the center of the country, and of the, of the voting spectrum. That's where I would like to start. I'll leave the other ones and then we can continue. Thanks, Christina. Pamela, uh, I want to stay with this question. Uh, your, your thought about is there a center? Has the center collapsed? And Claudia talked about the fact that she thinks the center is still very strong, but that the 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 leaders are taking them. There's a there's a, there's a polarization amongst the political elite who are trying to take people to opposite ends, where in fact maybe the citizens haven't wanted to go. Do you, if I if I paraphrased you right, Claudia, and I obviously give you right to step in and, and correct if I'm wrong. But Pamela, what's your view about all of that? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ken and Karen, for the invitation. It's a pleasure to stay here with all these colleagues. And um, that's a very good question about the political center. Uh, we were talking about polarization, about the el political elite polarization or social uh, polarization. And I think that to understand what is going on in Chile, we have to see in, in a separate way the presidential election and the a congressional election of the parliament. Because in the parliament, we see, as Christina, um, Claudia, and Carmen say, um, we, we, we can see that the traditional political parties are still there. Many people thought that uh, because of the uh, awakening of the 2019 or because of the constitutional convention, maybe the traditional political parties is gone, we are not to see it in the, in the Congress. But the election of the last Sunday showed that they're still there, the political parties are still there. And if, in, in, and if we see what is happening in the presidential election, the issue it was that because of the fragmentation of the candidates, we have seven candidates, people, moves uh, from the vote in the Congress and the vote in the presidential election. For example, we can see the result of a, a, to the right a party's coalition. Um, 
people from the right vote for the candidates to Congress from the traditional parties, but they vote in the presidential election to cast. But I think that the, the center right is, is, is still present in the political spectrum. And in the case of the, um, of the left and the center left, uh, people from the center left vote for the traditional parties, the PPD, Partido Socialista, Democracia Cristiana, but because of the coalition is different now, because of the Communist Party is in the Prado Dignidad now, we see yeah, a different in the uh, vote to the presidential election. So Boric and Cass uh, uh, win the position to the second round. But the center is still in the in the political spectrum. I, 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 and, and I think that the issue here is who is the people who is voting because the uh, electoral participation in Chile is, is slow. Uh, we, we have 47% uh, of people uh, voting the last um, Sunday, but we don't know what is going on with the, the, the electoral participation in the second round in December. And I think that because of the polarization of this, this second round, um, because uh, CAS is the far right and body to represent the left, maybe people from the center, center right or center left is going to participate in the second round. But I think that the, the political center is in the Congress. The problem here is that because of the institutional design of our political system, because we have a presidential system with a multi-party system that it represents a fragmentation in the Congress, either candidate who, who won the election in December needs to uh, have a negotiation, a dialogue with the political parties in Congress. And that's the problem with the polarization in this, in this second round. I think that candidates to the presidency, if, if they want to really um, offer governability to the future, they need to, to have a majority in the Congress. And that's is important to this um, uh, this month that we are talking about, you know, programs and expectation of uh, what is going to be the the next government. So I I I I feel like that we have a presidential election that is polarized, but the Congress is fragmented in, in very different positions. The right in Chile has two different positions. There is a far right that represented CAS and the Republican Party, but also there is a democratic right, yeah? And maybe um, that we are going to see different positions for the, um, for the next years in the Congress separated the, these two uh, positions from the right. Um, and maybe the democratic right is going to be more in the center as it, uh, and it's going to be the, cent the center left uh, in the Congress. So I think that there, there is like a difference between the presidential election and the elections uh, uh, in the Congress. Thank you, Pamela. Yeah, we have a couple of really good questions that have come in, one particularly about uh, the makeup of Congress and the, the push and pull between the executive, particularly if it's cast. Um, Claudia, it looked to me like you were dying to jump in here uh, and talk a little bit, I mean, and, and which is fine. I, I, what I, what I want to ask, and it's going again a little bit to what Christina said about trying to move a little bit to the center to maybe get votes, and we have to figure out where those votes are. You know, Parise, as we know, has votes, and and the others as well. But I, I guess the idea is if you are cast, for example, uh, and you are against equal marriage, if you are against abortion, if you are against human rights treaties, if you are down the line in a very strict kind of a way, um, what room do you have to move to the middle? Unless you say, I was only kidding, I actually do believe in LGBT rights and et cetera, et cetera, and to use just one example. Christina, where, where do you, and, and Claudia, I'm gonna to come to you because I know you want this one too, but, but Christina, you're the one who raised that. And I guess the question is, 
where is where is cost movement? How much movement does he have? Room does he have to move to anything more than what he is? Well, I I think this election has more to do with economics and uh, law and order and crime and other other issues and the fear of communism, which is installed, whether it's true or not, there's a huge fear for it, more than in those other issues, which are extremely important, but probably he, it's gonna be harder for him. But I think the election and the cleavage in this election is, is uh, more in, in the issues that CAST has been strong in putting forward, uh, safety, security, uh, and I and and I believe that he will continue with that and continue to get support. Parisi's voters are pro-economy. Today, this morning, a, a few minutes ago, Parisi gave an interview saying that if Boric won, the Chilean economy was going to uh, in uh, undirse. It was oh, going to sink. It, yeah. it was going to yeah. sink. Uh, he just said that. He so it's something that is. Uh, I, I believe that's going to be the cleavage. Obviously, the tension of the e, of the most evalu, uh, value issues uh, and in in the election. Obviously, feminist matters, uh, uh, conservative, anti-abortion, etc., are going to be a problem for him to grow for sure. But I think those other matters that are stronger today in this election and in this cleavage will definitely allow him to grow. And at uh, and and at the same time, I think he should bring other people to his uh, campaign and bringing other people that are more liberal from the right will probably open up that space as well. It's not easy, but I think that's the way to go. Um, he has to address human rights and feminist issues and social issues, but in improving economic policies, pro-market, not destroying what we have, not going into a, a, a state-based economy is something that he has defended pretty well, as well as all the issues on, on crime uh, and, and successfully done it. That if you see the votes for him in the South of Chile, where we have a, a, that Aucanía conflict, it's amazing how far he won and how huge, amazingly, amazing voting he had. Good, thank you, Christina. Hey, Claudia, I'm gonna to go to you, but and Carmen may also have something, a lot to say about this as well. It hasn't been shown by exit polling and, and other um, ways of finding out information that in fact, the, the voters for a uh, cast were, the, their number one priority was security. Um, however, security is defined, the crime and security, I suppose, is, is the way it may have been posed versus Boric's voters or voters for Paris. I mean, how, how did that break down in terms of what the primary concerns were for each voter? Carmen, do you, Claudia, I know you've been patient on this one. Carmen, do you actually have some statistics on that? Uh, unfortunately, I do not have them because we don't have mm. exit polls in Chile. So it's mm. impossible to have. There are some surveys, but uh, that have been going around uh, showing the data, but I, I'm, I'm, we don't have the data. Uh, but I do think that we need to, we must, start to understand that, that it's not a cohesive group, each of these groups of voters. So cast voters are not as cohesive as we would think. It's not like the cast voters and the Boric voters. They're rather like a heterogeneous groups. Some of them are older, some of them are younger. Um, and I think it's illustrative to see the campaign, uh, how he managed, managed us. Uh, but, um, Gas was very strong on social networks. He even had like in TikTok, which was a completely the ideologized uh, campaign. It was kind of fun. He dressed as a Jedi sometimes. So he had, but I think his strength uh, regarding his, uh, law and order, security, that's the main concern. Chile has, and this I have data, uh, Chile is a very, a country that always has privileged uh, privilege law and order over liberties. We, um, before the social burst, within between the social burst, it decreased, but it still was the ma the majority of the population. So it's a big issue, and and but it has there like an ambiguous discourse. He's uh, in 
stretch from one side and from the other. He, he tries to make a, a speech that he's more set, less. Uh, he was at the end of the day one of the politicals that signed the November 15 agreement. So, but but he has some conflicting issues. So that would be uh, for that electorate uh, would be an issue. Um, and I'm. I'm kind of switching points here, but I'm, I'll let others speak. But I wanted to point that um, I think the cast may um, show some uh, moderation more if he's able to have moderate center right important figures that are key on women's issue, uh, um, environmental issues, economic issues, because that's a key issue and his uh, cast a program was very weak on that. And remember that one month ago, it wasn't unthinkable what, what we're discussing today. So it's, um, so I think he has the space to grow showing commitment and, and the question is, would the public believe? Uh, but it is more stretched because he has the PC that's very strong and, and we have to see how much he can move. He made a statement about how uh, that he will stay as a, um, major but then he was uh, the pc started saying that th that's not how you should do it so he has he's more um has more limits so and i think um claudia and, and others have mentioned the key thing is who will vote uh, do paris votes will vote or not vote so um, i want just to say that well let's just stay with that for one second is where where are there votes to be had I mean, if, if, the general tenor of this conversation, you know, Paris is saying Boric will, will destroy the economy. I mean, we can we can hypothesize about where some of these votes might go, but it, you might you might come to the conclusion that it would seem that Cast definitely is the front runner for a number of votes, for at least those of Paris and, and maybe even some of the others. And Seychelles already he hasn't expressed himself yet, but it's clear what he thinks about Boric. So if the, if the idea is that Boric needs to find new voters who didn't vote the first round, who are they? And, where, and, and, and where, where might they be coming from? Do you have any idea about, thought about that? Carmen? Yeah. Uh, oh, you're, on, you're on mute, okay, good. Yeah, yeah. sorry. Uh, no, I think that, um, well, I thought, and, and I have to confess, I had a previous meeting at SEP with uh, Axel Calliz and uh, Gonzalo Mueller. We also discussed that, so I this is not my idea, but I think uh, Axel, um, that he mentioned that, uh, but it's also, we have to think about those who did not vote in this election, but did vote on the plebiscite. So maybe that's a space that he could grow. So not so much as convinced though that already voted, but moved towards those that did not voted in the election, but were motivated enough to vote for the plebiscite, which is probably a younger electorate. We don't have still data on the participation by age groups, but it seems, uh, since it's lower, we could think about. And so probably his strength, his growth strategy is not, a more, not so much of those who voted, but tried to capture those that did not mobilize for this election and, and, and try to mobilize them. That's hard. But, but I think it's easier than, uh, and, and we tend to think that um, Paris's vote and that, I think it's much more fluid. People vote, but, but perhaps they will not listen to the leader saying for whom they would, should vote. Right, okay. Claudia, you've been so patient and there's a smorgasbord of issues here, which I know you want to talk about. So the floor is yours. No, it's because I forgot to say something <laughs> with, with regard to your question about the center. When we were talking about the center, there was a point I wanted to make and I forgot. And and right after I turned off my mic, I remembered. So I, I started putting faces like, ah, I Good. forgot. Well, start no, with that I, one. Start with that I, one. Go ahead. What I wanted to say regarding the center is that I think that the center is there. It's We don't have a polarized uh, citizenry. But the parties that used to incarnate that center no longer have a broad support. So the problem is that the problem is what everybody has mentioned here. It's the um, it's the uh, loss of uh, trust and support by political parties. So all the all the candidates that made it to the second round and and that had successful campaigns uh, campaign against political parties. And so we have a very, very anti-political parties and sometimes even anti-politics 
um, scheme today. So this center is not that it's not centrist anymore. It's not that it's polarized, but it's not. It doesn't trust in institutionalized political parties. So we we do not see them in the Christian Democracy, the PPD, even the Socialist Party. Um, so that that was the first uh, point I wanted to make regarding the. I, I agree with Christina that the main issues here at stake are the economic program. And basically, what what, what Boric is saying is uh, we should move towards a welfare state, to universal provision of social services from a targeted to a universal social policy to make it taxes less regressive, so to rely less on the consumption tax, which is the main tax in Chile, and more on corporate income taxes, reduce loopholes, reduce exceptions, both legal tax avoidance and illegal tax evasion. But in addition to that, uh, Boric has a very progressive and rights-oriented cultural agenda. And I think that, that may be problematic for some centrist voters. So many, I think there are um, voters that agree with the with the social part of the program, but get scared with this, uh, you know, uh, cultural agenda of uh, uh, women rights, LGBT rights, and and all the symbolic changes in the appearance of politicians, not not showing the flag. Uh, I don't know in the, in the conventional. Uh, a convention member walking without shoes. So this symbolically, I think, may be threatening to a more centrist um, electorate that uh, that don't that that don't feel um, uh, that don't relate to this uh, to all this um, symbolic uh, change regarding rights and, and 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 fear this reformist impulse. And we see that it was capitalized by the right when they say, oh, the left wants to change the flag, they want to change the name of the country. So they're saying this refoundational left want to do everything again and we will lose all of, all of our traditions. So I think that's something that body should uh, give tranquility to, an, to, to grow to the center. And, and to finish, I think everybody has been saying that in Chilean history since the return to democracy, every time a candidate has uh, won the first uh, position in the first round, it has made it in the second round as well. So every first uh, elect, elect uh, uh, position in the first round has become president. That's right, but I think if you see historically the difference between the first and the second in, uh, in the first round, it has been uh, narrowing. And we have the narrowest, the, the, the smallest difference between the first and the second of only two points. So we've, we've haven't had, we haven't had this scenario before. And, and that gives, I think, uh, some level of uncertainty to the result. I think us uh, so far with this electoral has the best chances to win. But if Boric manages to uh, make new voters of that 50% that, that doesn't vote come and, and reduce the fear of all these changes, all of this reformist, reformist impulse, he could um, become president. Thank you, Claudia. Uh, thank you very much, Claudia. Uh, uh, Pamela, um, first of all, are there any, any comments you want to make about what you've heard? But I also want to uh, transition to the relationship between the executive and this new Congress and the executive and the constituyente. I think those are you know, two interesting bodies there that need to be brought into this conversation. But before I ask that question to you, Pamela, did, did you want to comment on anything that you've heard in the um, last several minutes? Yeah, I, I, I just want to agree uh, that the agenda for this uh, second round is going to be economics and also law and order. Um, I think that the electorate of Paris is more similar to caste. Uh, so I think that that um, that the people that vote to Paris, maybe they are going to be to vote for CAS, but we don't know if they are going to, to go to, to vote on December because that electorate is not from um, a traditional uh, electorate, electorate in Chile. But the case for Gabriel Boric is how to build a new um, uh, coalition with the center left. Um, uh, Gabriel Boric in, in the last 24 hours has been meeting with the president of the Democracia Cristiana, uh, with a, um, a, this is a center party and the president for the Christian democracy say that 
she's going to propose to her party to support Boric. That is a very important issue, not just for the, um, for the votes, but the, for the symbolism that, that the, the Christian democracy is the center position in Chile. And that's, um, uh, that issue is important because also Boric is changes his um, um, program to, from the feminist, uh, um, ecological and minorities rights to the issues of economy and law and order. So I think that with that agenda, Boric can reach an electorate that didn't uh, vote in the last election. That I, I agree with the, that the issue in December is the question about how many people is going to vote and who is going to vote. Um, and that I think that is, it's, is really important for the, for the next uh, uh, weeks. And for the question uh, uh, between, uh, to the relationship between executive power, the Congress and constitutional convention, I think that for any candidate who wins the election on December, uh, he is going to be, he needs to, to build a relationship with the Congress. Um, because we have a problem with the institutional design. We have a very presidential system with a fragmented multi-party system. So that is going to be an issue in the constitutional convention. The question about the political regime is a question uh, in, to the constitutional convention. And to, to the relationship between the constitutional convention with Congress and the executive, I think that the result of the election of the last Sunday, it's it, it, the last Sunday, it's put on clear that this Congress um, is not going to approve, for example, um, issues like the um, uh, uh, plebiscites, the intermediate plebiscite, or extend the time to the Constitutional Convention. I think that it's clear that the Constitutional Convention has to work with these rules and needs to be um, very, um, um, and, and they need to, to understand that the uh, plebiscite in the next year, it, it's going to be in a political context that is really different to, from to 2019 or 2020. Thank you, Pamela, uh, very much. And thanks for getting us started on that question. Christina, I wanna to come to you on that now uh, and going into, the, into the, the relationship between the executive and Congress. And we have a number of questions, but uh, I think Adriana Vega here has, has posed a question that is, is pretty much encapsulates uh, where we wanna go with this. And the question is, is though Cast is now in top spot and let's assume that he might win the second round, his coalition actually has a, fall, a, a small share of Congress so how does a, con a cast administration govern with this legislative makeup? Christina, your thoughts about that? Well, thank you. Yeah, it's not gonna, they're not gonna be easy, nor for cast, nor for Boric. It's gonna be tough for it, any of those that win to negotiate. Uh, I, I think the good thing for cast, if he is elected, is that he has half of the Senate and he doesn't, it's not a weak right wing. I know there's difference between the right and there's a more conservative and more liberal people from the right, but at the same time, they end up voting together in major issues. So I think he can align those votes, block a lot of uh, things that Piñera has not been able to block in, in Senate uh, nowadays. But my concern, and, my, and I, I want to raise a point that, uh, that hasn't been there, but it, so that we can discuss, my greatest concern is the convention. Because basically, whoever wins uh, will have changed rules of the game after the convention ends and they draft a new constitution. Most probably, that new constitution will be drafted to change the presidential system, to change the electoral system, maybe to change Senate and Chamber of, uh, of Deputies to one, uh, uh, only one uh, chamber in Congress. Those changes are huge. Any, any of these presidents will have to be part of that change and to implement that change. But what scares me the most is that if Cast wins and they're, they're, 
someone already, the vice president of the convention said it yesterday, if Cast wins, maybe they will reduce his term to two years and he will just be very quick, go, quickly gone. And that can, I'm not, I'm not worried about the polarization today, but that polarization tomorrow can be strong because if they want to take him out of office before the four years, that's going to be very tough. And, and, and I would say that to do they vote, today's votes demonstrate that Chile don't want huge changes drastically. They want changes moderately. Uh, uh, we have seen uh, issues-based electorate. We have, uh, we, what we are seeing here is more moderation in this vote, even if these two candidates have gone to second round and they are polarized, but at the same time, we, they only got 27, 29, 30% of the votes. It's not like other elections where you had, they had 30 something against 30, you know? This is less, they have to go and look for more. The second round is going to be moderate, but the second part, not only the Congress is going to be tough forecast, but I think the convention will come after him, which is really bad, but that's probably something that can happen. If Boric wins, uh, they might want re-election, <laughs> four plus re-election. So I don't know. I think that's all open and that uncertainty is not good for Chile. Uh, I hope the convention listens to this election uh, moderately and understands that people want change, but not they, they don't want huge transformation. Not They don't want to destroy all of what we have in Chile today. Uh, and if they understand that, I think we can live in a, Good democracy. If not, I am. I am definitely worried of that possibility more than this second round four weeks, which will definitely be. And and to go into everybody else's points, we will see Boric bringing in technical people like Andrea Repeto, bringing people from different uh, backgrounds of ex concertación socialist party. He's going to try to moderate. The same is going to be done by cast. They will all go to find the DC and Evopoli in the center. They will try to conquer those votes. I, that, that's what's going to happen in the second round. It, 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 at the same time, they need to maintain tension in the election and maintain the, the, what they said in the, the night of, of the election. Uh, Boric said Demo democracy versus fa fascism, fascism. And Cass said democracy versus communism. And that tension is going to be here also because that's what makes people go to vote. People are gonna stand up because of that tension in this second round, but their programs and everything is gonna to tend to moderate. My, I am worried about the relationship between a, a radical convention and whatever comes next. That, that would be my, my points to raise. Okay, okay Christina, thanks for, for going off on that. So, so Claudia, um, here we are the possible tension between the Constituyente as we understand it's currently composed with a lot of independence, but obviously with, with um, uh, process moving forward. So there's certainly some understanding of what the components of those delegates are and where they're seeing things. Uh, are we setting ourselves up for uh, maybe not so much with Boric or maybe, maybe as well, but do you see particularly with caste presidency, a, a, a a flashpoint, a very serious flashpoint that could be more than a point, but could be a long and un very, very unpleasant struggle. I do. I think um, I, I take very seriously what Christina was saying. I think it's very unfortunate that the convention, uh, this idea that the convention may start tempering with presidential terms uh, according to who wins the election. We have seen that in other countries in Latin America where the main issue has ended up being in constitution making processes, the presidential term and the possibility or not of re-election. So far, I have not seen in, uh, in, in, in Bo on Boris's side or on the convention any sign that uh, there's any suggestion to uh, allow for re-election, for presidential re-election. I have not seen that. Jaime Vasa said something yesterday. Uh, yes. After about re-election? Re -election? Yes. I, I have heard about reducing the presidential term. So I think it would be very unfortunately to take long-term decisions um, in the view of long-term electoral results. And, uh, and I think that's dangerous. And I, I, I still trust the convention. I think the convention has been quite wise so far 
uh, not to bring uh, the presidential campaign, for instance, into the into the convention's work so far. But I do I agree that that's a concern, and we we should be uh, looking at that. But uh, but I do think the the presidential uh, who who wins the presidency will be very important for the for the success of the constitution making process. And this Congress will will make it. Uh, also complex to achieve the goals of the convention because we have a divided Congress. Uh, it will be hard to negotiate as everybody here mentioned. And Congress is the one, first of all, in charge of implementing the, the new constitution. So after the constitution is approved, you need to change many laws to uh, bring them into accordance with the constitution. And, and that ha will have to be done by Congress. So even if the con con constitution is approved in the exit plebiscite in 2022, you have to start a legislative work that will take a very long time and that will be in the hands of this Congress. And the other thing is that if the president, the president clearly received all the votes of the rechazo, of the rejection of the new constitution. If the president becomes an, an actor against the constitutional convention, it may, this may have an effect in um, fostering the, the rejection of the, of the constitutional convention after its work, and I think that would be a very bad, uh, very bad news for Chile and for this process of channeling social demands through an institutional process. And it would bring us back to square one and probably to um, protests in the street, social increased social mobilization, and um, I think it would be very bad for stability and for for governability. So I think in that sense, a Boric government uh, would be more would be smoother for the constitution making process than a caste government even though of course congress uh, is still um, something that we have to see how it will work with the convention but of course there is a very strong impact of the president and the congress in the workings of the convention thank you claudia i know we're over our hour we have dozens of questions here we're trying to integrate a few of them as we go along if the panel could just Bear with, bear with us for another few minutes. Uh, I know we've kept you over your lunch hour, um, but let, let me ask this question. Then. The relationship, and Pamela, I'll come to you on this. Um, the relate for the new, maybe you could re refresh the the the, um, the memory of the folks who are, the folks who are listening to this event is when when the new constitution is pre prevent uh, presented. Congress has something to say about this, does it not? Or and, and what? Or, or I guess the question is, does it have anything to say at all, or is it all completely in the hands of the voters? No, the Pamela, new, yeah, the, yeah. The, the the draft of the new constitution is going to be approved or re rejected in a plebiscite in a national referendum. Mm -hmm. So the Congress has nothing to to do with that. Maybe they can they can have positions about the approval or not the new text and it's more like a political position, but if they had no institutional um, role in the in the in the new constitution in the draft. Um, so okay, so then the, the question I have is, if, and if I'm not mistaken, the implementing legislation for the for the constitution was that if there is a quote substantial change in government, I think those are the operating words. I may have it right. Like uh, then, you know, elections could be called. So, for example, if if there is a decision to go to a parliamentary system in Chile, one might imagine not to play out in everybody's worst fears of complete social unrest and conflict and the like. But it's it's not an inconceivable scenario that uh, under even the implementing legislation, an election could be called within several months, you know, if, if you know, if, if the first term, if the presidential term starts in March, then the Constitution needs to it will come down by August and a vote sooner, more or less thereafter. Um, and there is a substantial change in government, however, that wants to be defined, I suppose, by the courts, um, that in fact, Chile could find itself having another election within the space of a year. Is that, is that playing out absolutely the worst, most scary scenarios, or is that something that's, that's being talked about a bit as, as a possibility? Two years, maybe, not one. In two, in two years, okay. Claudia, do you see that as a possibility? It, it is a possibility, but uh, I don't think it's the main uh, issue right now. 
So the fear of the length of the presidential term, I think the, the reason that the convention has this mandate and is allowed to do this is because, for instance, if we switch from a bicameral to a unicameral system, the idea was that the uh, new system would not have to wait eight years for uh, for the Senate, you know, for every senator to finish their term and then start the, the new system. But a, a presidency of four years is not incredibly long, uh, particularly considering, considering that we have many months still to go. So I don't see this really like a like the main issue uh, at stake. I, I don't think uh, I, I don't think uh, it's in the spirit of the convention to try to temper with the presidential term, even though, of course, there are some fears have been raised about this. Uh, thank you. Uh, Carmen, did you please jump in? Yeah, um, I think there's an additional um, issue um, that it would be very harmful. I think um, if one of the two candidates win, and it's most likely if Gus win, there's a temptation, which I, I'm not sure it will happen, uh, that the, if they will shorten the term, or even not a temptation, but a, a substantive change and they want to shorten the term, uh, there's a fear, or, or they could be, that the, the exit plebiscite of the constitution becomes a, um, a recall plebiscite. So we, so you will be, uh, it, so the constitution will go kind of submerged, and the big polarization issue is cast or not cast, and that would be very, very harmful uh, for the not only for the political situation, but also for the fates of the new constitution. I agree uh, with all my colleagues here. I think it, it's a good thing to have a new constitution, uh, and, but the new constitution must be approved uh, and we have to work towards that. Um, but I think the signals are positive. We, it's true that one, the, one of the vice president uh, of the convention made some statements, but then when the, within the hours on, yesterday morning, I think, was uh, the table, the authority of the convention made a very um, moderate and very calm um, um, congratulations to both candidates, very moderate. So I think they understood uh, what's the, what at stake here. Uh, so I'm, I'm mildly positive that uh, the Constitutional Convention would also understand the shifts uh, in the in, in what is revealed from the society that they want changes but they want changes kind of in order I think that's the kind of so and and I think there's an important group and I hope it's uh, more than two-thirds that see that um, it's key to have a, a, a constitution and it has to be more moderate perhaps than was thought before uh, the new results uh, call for probably a more moderate than it would be perhaps uh, but I would think that's a key issue that we not that the exit plebiscite does not turn into a um, cast if it's cast the one that wins. If it's bodied, I think it's less likely that it could happen, but it still could happen. And in either case, it's very dangerous that the plebiscite is um, presidentialized again. Okay, Carmen, just one final note on that. Um, did I hear you say that you think that the the constitutional delegates seeing what they're seeing, what happened with the election results, it might um, affect them to moderate their positions going forward in the work that they do at the Constituyente. Did, did you say that? You thought yeah. that might have some effect on, okay, well, no, that's an interesting, that's an interesting comment. Yeah, I think, well, we have extremes at the both ends of the constitutional convention. That's that's uh, we see the votings we've seen at the uh, at steps of sorry that I self promote not me but the 72 mm -hmm. platform that they show the, the distribution of votes. Uh, we have strong extremes, but there's a and my hope and I think the understanding of many is that we have a hopefully a two thirds mod within those extremes uh, and that will give them more, I think, more. In, better readings of the what the the in the preference of those citizens are and what they expect from the constitution. So I think they, they probably would moderate uh, or give them more strength towards their impulse of moderation. I'm not saying that the, um, that the constitutional convention is not moderate per se, but I think this would give them more strength towards other groups that are more extremes regarding what the citizens want. So yeah. Well, that's an interesting comment. I want to, I think I want to close on that right there. 
we've gone 10 minutes over our allotted time. Uh, thank you very much to all the panelists. Um, Karen, would you like to say anything in closing? No, uh, please. No, thank all the panelists. Thank you. It was a great uh, discussion. Uh, we're going to see what happens during the month, and hopefully we'll be able to discuss it the day after the elections, the runoff, which is uh, on December 19th. Thank you, Ken and Marta, as always, and uh, we we'll look forward to seeing you in Chile, uh, Ken. Uh, well, why not? It, it, maybe I think, yeah, if the quarantine is lifted, then maybe we'll do this, this post-election the day after from on the ground in Santiago. We'll well, see if we can get everybody in one room, maybe with masks, maybe without, top, maybe without tapa bocas, we'll see. Um, but thank you all for joining. Uh, we, as we say, we will have this video, at least on the CCA website, available by the end of today. Um, we will be hearing about our next event on Chile, as well as the other events that I mentioned earlier on Colombia with Ingrid Betancourt and Roberto de la Calle and in Brazil. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you for your patience. Uh, and, and thank you for the, the wonderful insight of this panel. We, we love having, we love convoking this panel and we love having this discussion with you. So have a nice day, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.